I'm here today, I'm happy to be back. This is my fifth time in Beirut and fourth time at uh, MD Lab, so it's really wonderful for me to be able to continue to engage uh, here at the, at the lab and support the work that Jad and his team have been doing. Um, as Jad mentioned, I'll be doing two, uh, two talks. Today's talk, uh, this is kind of part one and part two of some of the work that I've been involved in in media literacy and then specifically in digital civic activism. So today's talk, uh, which is, um, uh, which I think might build or take a step back from some of the specific topics we've been discussing, um, notions of civic imagination and by new media necessary and then other talks we've heard about political economy and tomorrow when we hear about privacy. Uh, today's talk will be about um, this space and field of digital media literacy. So uh, I'll just throw a little bit of my work here to talk about my, um, what I'll hope to impart on you. So since Jad and I finished at the University of Maryland, I've been really interested in, um, in the intersection of media, voice, and engagement in civic life. And so this has led me to doing a lot of research on the ways in which we can prepare young people to be more engaged, critical um, consumers and producers of media. So my earlier work had looked at issues of news and engagement, had looked at issues of young citizenship, and obviously media literacy education as it can um, allow young people to find their voice in more effective ways. Uh, today's talk will be about some of that research and some of the things that I've noticed in uh, in the media literacy space. And then tomorrow, I'll present on the concept of digital civic activism, some newer work that I'm looking at and how people are using technologies and practices to engage meaningfully in everyday civic, civic actions. So this is part one is more foundational and framework and part two is um, more about the activism side of it. Uh, so just briefly, as Jad mentioned, I'm an associate professor of media studies at Emerson College. Emerson College is a, it's a urban school in the middle of Boston, Massachusetts. It's right on the Boston Common, and it focuses entirely on media and arts. Uh, everything from film to uh, journalism and then to performing arts, writing, literature, and publishing. Uh, I also um, work as a co-director of something called the Engagement Lab. I'll talk more about that tomorrow. That's an applied research lab that's uh, focused on building technologies and tools to help engage people in civic life. And then, as you've been hearing about from Jad and earlier Henry, uh, I direct a program in Salzburg um, called the Salzburg Academy on Media and Global Change, which is where, uh, which is where some of us have just come from. Uh, when that's a for ten years now, it's been gathering young people from around the world to. Uh, think about how they can use media to solve pressing problems. Um, okay, so, so that's a little bit about me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually start with a story uh, to, to enter into this media literacy space. So this happened to me, um, this happened to me three years ago, and it was, it started in Salzburg, which is where I just was before I flew here. Um, and this story, uh, this story, I think, is a good metaphor for how we might enter into thinking about digital media literacy. So in 2013, uh, in August, uh, the night before I was flying from Salzburg to Beirut, there was a story that, um, there was a story that emerged. So there was a Turkish Airlines pilot on a flight that landed. It was a flight before the one I was going to take. And, uh, and one of the pilots had been kidnapped when, he, when he, was, he landed at the Beirut airport and when his shuttle was taking them to the hotel, he was kidnapped, um, he was kidnapped by a group and taken to the to, to a border and then I think he was released some days later. When this happened, um, this is some of the Google searches that, um, that, had, that, so my wife was in Boston at the time, this is the way I'll say it. And she was watching the news and she heard about this. And she did a Google search and I asked her to save the screenshot. And here's what was coming up when she was searching Beirut. Um, I was in Salzburg talking to Jad and Jad was telling me quite a different story uh, of, what the, of what was happening here in Lebanon. So my, what, my wife obviously got nervous. I had her do an image search of just the word Beirut from Boston, Massachusetts. Not Beirut kidnapping, not Beirut, but just simply Beirut. And this was what 
emerged on her Google image screen. And then when we came to Beirut, we did a Google search on Jazz computer images about Beirut, and this is what emerged on Jazz screen. So you understand, so, so I was being called from home in Boston, what's happening in Beirut, why, why is the military everywhere, there's a kidnapping, you, you shouldn't be there, you need to leave. Meanwhile, this is what um, Jad was showing me, saying, oh, it's, you know, Beirut's fine, this is something different. I tell this story uh, because I think this, this is a good metaphor that introduces us into the way that um, the importance of what, what Howard Rheingold wrote when he said, the future of digital culture, mine, yours, mine, and ours, depends on how well we learn to use media that have infiltrated, amplified, distracted, enriched, and complicated our lives. So in, in, in a sense, the way that I understand media and why media literacy is essential to the future of digital culture or the future of global culture is simply put because media literacy is, is, is asking the question of how we will use and misuse media to shape the future of these tools and technologies and the way that we can, in, in, in any, our own limited ways, be part of, um, be part of those, those citizens around the world that are shaping how, how media is used and misused for years to come. Um, so I'm going to start by providing some foundations. My goal will be to provide a little bit of foundations of what's happening in digital culture today, and then to take us through how media literacy has approached the space and then leave you with a few, uh, leave you with a few uh, frameworks for what I think media literacy means to young people today. So here is uh, what I see as the nexus of engagement, um, media and engagement in digital culture. And this was something that I, I outlined a few years ago now. And it, and it was trying, and I was trying to get at the idea of um, this, this, this former distance between media and citizens. And I think there's still a distance, which is why you'll see many of the circles are not concentric. But there's been a collapse between media production and, and, and civic reception. So citizen audiences are less passive than they've used to be, and media is less top down. And I think there's been three specific factors that I've identified that approach this. Uh, the first is mobility, the second is connectivity, and the third is spreadability. And I want to take you through each of these to try to talk through how this is changing the landscape, the relationship between how media functions and how citizens, um, how citizens formerly consumed information and now I think more um, consume and then repurpose information. Uh, so mobility, so mobility is, is quite an easy one. This is the first in the chain. Mobility, I don't think it's a surprise anymore that we've seen a complete inversion of time and space and related to how we use media. So in the past, we would organize our, um, we'd organize our lives around information. Uh, we'd have TV shows on at certain times. We've had, we've had papers published at certain times. That still happens. But I think more and more you see that we organize media around our lives. It, it, it kind of, it fits neatly into the, the side of our phone and it, and it dictates how and where, um, how, it, it no longer dictates how and where we can use media to find information. Um, so here's one example of this. Um, the pictures are two different events, of course, um, but they show, these are both in the Vatican, um, and this is a, a um, the one picture of uh, Pope's funeral, and here's one of Pope's inauguration. Uh, obviously, they're different events, so they might want different responses, but I think you can see we have one early adopter up here who's using a flip phone, and here there's no hands that are not using a phone. So ubiquitous mobile technologies uh, have, embraced, have embraced our lives. This is a, um, and she's not circled because she's old. Um, she's circled because this is a film premiere in London, and she's, um, and this picture was caught by a journalist when they were, I think it was Johnny Depp in the movie Black Mass was coming by. And the journalist had questioned whether anyone was actually seeing Johnny Depp or simply trying to attain a reproduction of Johnny Depp in real time. So you see everyone else here is trying to grasp the moment. And then there's, there's one woman here who is actually trying to be present in the moment. Um, so I think there's, there's a couple reasons why we said this. There's a, there's a scholar who I don't always agree with, but I think provides a useful frame for entry point, her name Cherry Turkle, and she talks about this notion of tethering. And we conducted a study with young people in over 50 countries 
Uh, and, it, and, it sh and the goal was for them to track everything they had been doing with mobile phones. And what we found was that the phone was not only the center of their physical lives, but it was at the center of their social lives, their information and communication mechanisms. Um, so um, we found a few things, and I'll, and I'll show these. Um, we found first that a very few social networks dominate in all aspects of mobile information and communication. So in over 50 countries that this study um, looked at, we found that um, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram were the dominant. And then there was a huge drop off. And the study looked at how people were using phones for information. And then there was a large drop off. And after that, it was weather and maps. And then after that, it was still even a larger drop off. So these social technologies, when we think about mobility, these kind of mobile social networks have, um, have, have almost replaced, if not displaced, all other forms of inf information consumption. And again, this was, um, this was in a younger demographic, so 18 to 25 years old, and it was from over 50 countries in the world. Uh, we found that on mobile phones, sharing information and commenting on people's social spaces are done more frequently than consuming information. So the default is not simply to consume. So when we think about um, you know, kind of media production and media ownership, I think we normally assume that there are the media who make and distribute and audiences who receive. And I actually think that's um, it's almost a false narrative or something that's changing. More and more in younger generations, people are no longer just receiving information and then letting it sit. They're finding ways to repurpose, share, or appropriate information for, for different means. And then lastly, uh, and not surprisingly, there were many findings in the study, but one important one was young people reported a feeling of anxiety when they had their phones in their pockets, but they were not allowed to use them. Uh, I don't think that's a surprise to anybody, but um, uh, something for us to consider. Um, so I think mobile phones have affordances according to Turkle. Uh, mobile phones allow us to always be heard, they allow us to control attention, and they allow us to never feel alone. So this is, uh, this is some of the reasons why I think we engage with phones on such a personal level, uh, but also um, the result of this is that phones have, there's a dependence on mobile phones as an act of self-establishment, where, um, where youth through their mobile devices turn other persons into self-objects to shore up their fragile sense of self. So what Sherry Turk is arguing is that while these phones have provided us a lot of ways to connect and a lot of ways to share and a lot of ways to be present, that presence is also, um, is also somewhat um, allowing us to feel more insular, to feel more, um, to feel more uh, I think, narcissistic in a way and also um, to, to objectify other humans as a way of reifying our own interests and beliefs. Uh, and so, um, so her, so her, so she kind of has a protectionist mode to how she thinks, but it's an important one. So here's a, 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 it's a popular video. Um, it's, a, it's a little brief. I don't, you might have seen this, but I'll just play a little bit of it um, to show you what she's arguing.
So you can see it's somewhat um, tongue in cheek, but, but I think it's not, the important thing is not for us to dichotomize this issue, but to, to see the central place that mobile technologies have had in, in, in the relationship between media, um, media production and citizen, and citizen reception of information. We'll come back to that more in a little bit. The second point, um, the second factor that I think has kind of collapsed the distance between media and citizens is this notion of connectivity. Uh, and Clay Shirky writes in his book, Cognitive Surplus, the logic of digital media, on the other hand, allows the people formerly known as the audience to create value for one another every day. So um, his argument, again, while, while quite long, um, actually shows this, the capacity these tools have to connect us. And I'll show you uh, very quickly. This is a, I don't know if you've seen this or Chad has shown this before here, but um, this actually looks at every second on the internet how much, um, how much content is being shared and produced. So this is um, the platform Reddit. So every second, if you look at this number here, um, that's how many, have, how many Reddit's votes have been cast. If we look at Instagram photos, every second, we're at over a million more since you've been here, so how much of this production actually happens? This is Tumblr, a popular blogging platform. Uh, here is Skype calls made. This is tweets. This is Dropbox files, and this is all in one second, the, the amount of Dropbox files. Here's Google searches, this is a fun one. In one second, the platform conducts this many searches. And then here's the more popular one, so this is YouTube. In one second, this is how many people will be searching YouTube at any given time. And then obviously Facebook, there's an important quote at the bottom that I'll get to, but I think the, the important idea here is that we have now embedded ourselves completely in these social tools. And, and what we're doing on those tools is important almost as important as we think about how we're being taught about how to use these tools. Uh, in the end of the day, they said that 10 years ago, Skype, none of these tools didn't exist. And 20 years ago, there were only 100 websites total. So this notion of connectivity, um, this notion of connectivity is an important one. Jose Van Dyck wrote in her book, The Culture of Connectivity, that connective culture is one that's inundated by coding, I mean that there's a lot of design that goes into this connective culture, that these tools are, um, are driven by a need to design for engagement. It derives from a pressure from peers and technologies to expand through competition and gain power through strategic alliances. So when we think about why we connect and why we use these tools, uh, she argues that we have to think about this culture of competition that is put upon us. So to be the most present in our social networks, to be the, to have a voice, to be expressive in how we think about these technologies, but also in the designers of the technologies themselves. When Facebook designs and when YouTube designs, they want there to be open engagement, but they're also designing for you to engage continuously. And this is, this is almost forcing us to connect. I'll talk a little bit more about that um, soon. And then lastly, um, it evolves by a resetting of boundaries between private, public, and corporate domains. So what we think about, I know Moses talked about this a little bit, but what we think about as, as big media and little media um, and alternative media, as Henry mentioned, changes in a connective culture. We can see the world connected through, um, through density maps. It's not all connected, most of it is, but there are still large parts of the world that continue to be black. Uh, Facebook connections is the same way. It reifies this kind of notion that we're connecting, but we're not completely connecting. We do have the potential here, though, to spread, uh, to spread information at a scale rarely seen in the past. Uh, out of this connectivity emerges this concept of network publics. This is something that Dana Boyd um, wrote about a few years ago, and she wrote that network publics are the space constructed through these technologies and the community that emerges as a result of the intersection of people, technology, and practice. And so I want, to think, I want us to think about this notion of connectivity because when we, when we understand the structure of connectivity, we see these technologies and designs being, being um, facilitating us connecting more. 
But what Dan Boyd is arguing is that it's simply um, another space for young people to go to, and it's what they do in there and how they imagine their sense of place and authenticity um, that really uh, that that will really define the value of the of the network itself. And then the third proposition I want to put forward is this concept of spreadability, and this is something that um, Henry um, Henry Jenkins has written about with a few of his colleagues. And um, he, he calls it creating value and meaning in a network culture. And in this, in this concept, I think the notion of spreadability, as he writes, is that audiences are making their presence felt by actively shaping media flows, and media makers are waking up to the need to actively listen and respond to them. So here again, we have this, um, we have this breakdown of, of concepts. And I've, we've, we even in my graduate classes appropriated some of your ideas and distilled them into uh, a visible way to see some of these transitions. When we think about this whole notion of spreadable content, it, it goes from a single individual staying in one space and consuming one piece of content for a long time into a dispersed flow of ideas and a constant negotiation back and forth between media producers and audience makers. And so in the spreadable culture, I think it is the audience or the citizenry um, that is actually, that it always has been, but that might have potentially more influence than they have in the past to dictate and to assert themselves into media dialogues. Uh, and spreadable information also uh, contributes to breakdown of uh, traditional platforms for, for distributing information. So when in Henry's work, when he talks about the flow of ideas, dispersed material, facilitating sharing, participation, grassroots intermediaries, and collaboration across roles. I think we can think about, um, we can think about the question of what makes information spread, what motivates people to spread information, and how that is sustained over time. Uh, so one example of spreadable media that, that, that I will share with you uh, is in New York. He's a New York kind of uh, digital filmmaker. And he's taken a civic issue and created a really compelling piece of local footage um, that I think has resonance for how we think about storytelling as a spreadable phenomenon. So I, I will, this is about um, being given a summons for a bike ticket in New York City and then his response to, um, his response to those who have, uh, who have provided him the summons. So. so I think it's important to recognize the style of the film. And also the way that it scales into the mass media at a certain point. I'm getting a ticket for riding my bike, not in the bike lane. Can't move my bike at all. I'm doing a little favor riding my bike. It's pouring rain out here. Yeah, you know, look at this. Look at these assholes. Look at this guy. Double park right here in a bus lane. You're not giving him a ticket. What's the plan?
there's explosions throughout the city. Tim Mainstream Media. Casey in Manhattan, you got a ticket this month? Uh, yeah, I got a, a ticket about three weeks ago for riding my bike not in the bike lane. Not in the bike lane. Alex is holding up a sign that says, <laughs> you could have just said it. Oh, okay. The sign says, not illegal. Yeah. I wish I'd known that before I paid the $50 ticket. Well, so... skills and is employing them using humor uh, and using um, subversiveness to, to talk back to the system that has provided him what he thinks is an injustice. So I, so I provide this landscape for us. If we think about these, these tensions of mobility, connectivity, and spreadability, I think they have collectively reframed how we might start to think about relationships between media companies or media producers and audiences. And I think there's a lot of collapse there. My goal in here is not to say, again, if we go back to Moses' talk, I wasn't here for it, but I, I've seen it now um, a couple of times. Um, I think it's good to acknowledge those frames and then to see how and where we can work around those frames and within them to think about, um, to think about appropriating content and appropriating messages for civic means. And how I think we get there is uh, is not is is systemically through um, I write this contemporary landscape necessitates a media literate population for active engagement in daily life. There has to be some way that that people learn skills and dispositions uh, to become actively engaged in daily life, to become the storytellers, to become the media makers. And in all of my research in this space. I've noticed that when you supply people with not only the critical skills of analysis and consumption, but also the critical skills of production and, and appropriation and sharing and expression, things I'll talk about um, in a little bit, uh, you see this sense of voice and the sense of agency emerge. Uh, and I think that's important. So, so today we'll talk through some of those frameworks and then tomorrow we'll look at how that agency can transform into activism. So I'm gonna, uh, put up three definitions of media literacy, none with which make much sense to me at all, but this is how they've been used. Um, they're quite broad. Uh, they talk about abilities to access, analyze, and evaluate, communicate, access, and analyze, evaluate, create, and act, and access, analyze, evaluate, and produce. Uh, these are, um, I think these are formulations of how we can approach a broad field. Uh, they don't say much without their application. So they're simply saying that there are a set of competencies and abilities that we need to be able to critically um, engage with media in all its forms. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in, um, in, in where this, how this has taken place in our society. And David Buckingham said um, a little bit over a decade ago now, that the media, it's often argued, have taken the place of the family, the church, and the school as the major socializing influence in contemporary society. Perhaps not, um, not uh, groundbreaking in any way, but reifying for us to think about as a socializing influence. So this is replacing some of our traditional institutions, and if not replacing them, uh, infiltrating them to the sense that our schools have largely become mediated, uh, the way that we communicate in schools, uh, uh, notions of church are, are somewhat more complicated, but definitely um, at home in the family that, that these technologies have, have, uh, have actually become major socializing forces of how we learn to communicate and be part of, uh, be part of others. So, um, so a little bit of context for how media literacy emerged. Um, it emerged as a, um, a dichotomy between the notions of protectionism and empowerment. And I heard someone in the audience ask Henry a question about protecting us from the, what the media is doing. Uh, and, and there's two sets of scholarship that have emerged in this space, both of them equally valuable to how we think about uh, preparing next generations for active life of engagement with media. Um, uh, so the first is protectionism. 
And in this field, uh, we see media literacy as a cognitive defense against overt and disturbing forms of sensationalism and propaganda pouring out of rapidly growing culture industries. So this was kind of made famous by, uh, well, there's a whole line of scholars in this field. Um, Neil Post was one of them in, in Amusing Ourselves to Death, who said that mass media and television will, uh, will erode the ability for citizens to have meaningful dialogue or engage in meaningful consumption of information. If left to their own dictates, they will just consume things like entertainment TV and reality TV. And so media literacy needs to be a way that we can protect our um, can protect our young people from uh, from the media's influence and impact on them. Um, this this still plays a great role in how we should approach media, and it, but it has less relevance as to be the entire picture of media literacy. Of course, we need to teach and and sh and share with young people the ways that media um, try to persuade or influence or dictate. But what this does also presume is that. Um, is that there's a, a media with a single media with a dominant ideology and a dominant message distribution function and audiences that are passive and that might be wins to the manipulation of these media systems. Uh, the other side of this coin is, is, is the empowerment uh, framework. And this is, um, this is taken from some work that Henry has been doing over the last decade or so. Um, and it comes from a longer lineage in cultural studies uh, where we think about the various cultural, social, and human influences, and we embrace the complexity in the relationship between media and audiences, and we use that to say, actually, you know, there's, um, there's a whole range of ways that we engage with media, and that we use media, and that media use us. And it's these complexities that, that we should embrace, and the way that we are empowered is by having our voice situated, whether it's in the middle of these or on the fringes, that we need to uh, teach people how to become storytellers, teach people how to use media for their own ends, and that we can empower active citizenry through doing this. And so I think if, you, if we look at this as emerging between these, here's one way that, people, that, uh, that one scholar has articulated this. Uh, we think about uh, media public health, media reform, online safety, as ways that we're protecting young people. So with public health, we want to protect them from unhealthy messages. We want to protect them from online bullying. But in the empowerment camp, we want to really teach them about youth production and about, um, and about digital media learning and about how to create news for yourself. So this industry, as the media literacy field, has, it can be seen in a big tent where you have these two modes of approaching it. I think those are both valuable and they both play an interesting role. Uh, in my work, I've seen that there's a disconnect that still exists between protectionist and empowerment approaches to media literacy. And it's something that I've been working hard to, uh, to reframe or think about in, in my work. Um, and that is that um, if we assume, we should not only assume that critical engagement with media equals critical engagement with society. Um, and that's both in theory and, and in practice. And that if we teach people how to better analyze or produce or create information, that they'll automatically then um, they'll automatically then be prepared to contribute meaningful from in society. That's often anecdotal, and it's often something that we that we simply assume is an outcome of being taught how the media works. So if we're seeing if we're showing how they work and how they function, um, or media, not the media, and also how we can use these tools. In no way should that, um, should that necessarily be assumed then that we will use these tools to engage more with society. And in fact, we found the opposite, and there's been a host of studies, and sorry for the text here, but I'll just talk through a few of them, um, that have actually pushed back on this assumption that, um, that, we're, that, we are, um, that, that if we're savvy media users, that we'll be more engaged. Uh, so there's been a host of research in the last five or so years that's showing that young people have difficulty negotiating the wide range of information made available via digital tools. Um, and a few studies I'll highlight here. One says that they lack the critical awareness to differentiate quality um, and intent across a myriad of converged platforms. They often are prone to overconfidence about their ability to critically navigate the web. Uh, so these are dispositions we see by continually propping up this notion of a digital native or born digital. Uh, overconfidence in news consumption breeds cynicism towards media outlets. 
um, which is a study that I completed a few years ago, which actually showed that if you, if you taught people how to more critically analyze the news and more, and, and more critically um, evaluate the news, that when you talk to them, it almost gave them a ticket to be cynical or gave them a ticket to kind of shut it off. If you didn't connect it to why that was important or what they could do, they often just became less trustful of news. I think that's valuable. I think we do want to breed some skepticism towards news, but it has to be driven into some other form of production or else it simply sits as a skepticism. Uh, and then the immediacy of the web leads to uncritical consumption and immediate pleasure over diverse and critical information choices. I think we've all been, uh, we've all fallen victim to this, and it's not necessarily a problem. But I think it's, uh, but I think we should question um, the the role of technologies in um, in how they uh, in how they actually um, how we can learn about media and how that connects to society. So I'll say this disconnect is perpetuated by the influence of digital culture on traditional approaches to media literacy. So in media literacy work, which is what you're doing here, uh, we've always seen it as a more traditional approach of, of this, again, this set of abilities. And I think in digital culture, we need to rethink this set of abilities. And I have a few, uh, a few um, examples of how digital culture is pushing back on media literacy. The first is this notion of performance. So when we think about our own um, situated space online, we can often think in critical terms, but the way that we behave and act is somewhat not always in line with that. And so here's one short video. It's kind of tongue in cheek, but it shows you uh, how performative our online identities can be. Um, so I'll show this quickly. engage and continually engage 
but it's much more human. In, in large media or traditional media literacy approaches, that engagement is not, it's not, um, it's not tangible and it's not something personal or felt. It's more uh, a, a form of passive consumption. But here in the online space, uh, we think about um, the need to manage our identities and manage how we choose to engage meaningfully and also socially. The second constraint on media literacy and digital culture is privacy. And I know tomorrow morning we'll be hearing more about this concept of privacy, so I'll just briefly um, cover it here, that we've, um, we struggle with private privacy somewhat um, consistently with how we negotiate what to share and what not to share. Uh, an unraveling theory that has emerged recently is that once enough people reveal their information, then not revealing your information becomes a stigma, even for those with less than ideal characteristics. So at a certain point, at least for young people, when we've talked to them, not being engaged and not being part of this social space and not being expressive is no longer an option because there's such a stigma associated with not being um, online or being expressive that they have to share. And so this is having an impact on how we understand media as well. The third is this notion of surveillance. Um, and and um, there's been a lot in the, in the news about this, and you'll hear more again tomorrow um, about the notion of, of how our technologies are giving to these companies what they want from us. And again, this is not simply traditional large mainstream companies. These new companies have reached further and, um, and deeper than many others in, in, in mining our information uh, for certain purposes. It's why in the United States, I don't know if, if you remember the case of the shooting in California when they found the shooter's iPhone, and there was a large debate. Apple resisted um, allowing the FBI to have access to the phone of the, the shooter citing privacy precedence uh, for the entire population. And this was quite a debate in the role of, um, of producers or governments or corporations have in our data. Uh, companies like Target do this all the time. Uh, every time someone shops at Target, it's a big US-based box retailer, and every time you swipe a credit card, you're, pro you're given one of these. Um, you have a guest idea, and you're, um, all the data is tracked back to, uh, is tracked back to um, back to how you shop so they can predict your behavior. Uh, and there's a short video on this uh, about how Target has done this, and I'll show it here quickly. Um, Did you know that by studying shoppers' habits, companies can predict what you want to buy? And sometimes, that's a problem. A few years ago, for instance, a father walked into a Target store in Minnesota clutching an advertisement. He started yelling at the manager, Did you send this to my daughter, he asked. The ad contained all these coupons for baby clothes and bottles and formula and cribs. She's still in high school and you're sending her ads for baby clothes, he screamed at the manager. Are you trying to encourage her to get pregnant? The store manager apologized and a few days later called the guy to apologize again. The father was somewhat abashed. It turns out there's been some activities in my house that I wasn't aware of, he told the manager. I had a long conversation with my daughter. She's due in August. It turned out I owe you an apology. Target had created a computer model that could figure out which shoppers were pregnant just by studying their shopping habits. Identifying pregnant women is the holy grail. People with new babies are so tired that if you can get them inside your doors to buy bottles and formula, they'll end up buying everything else they need as well. And if a new parent starts shopping at Target, they'll keep coming back for you. So how did Target start marketing to parents before the baby arrived? Lots of people buy lotion, but a Target data analyst noticed that women on Target's baby registry started buying very large quantities of lotion in about their second trimester. Someone else noticed that in about their 20th week, pregnant women started loading up on vitamins. By crawling through the data, Target was able to identify about 25 different items that when analyzed together, would allow them to predict if someone was pregnant. Target's program was so accurate that it could assign almost any regular shopper a pregnancy prediction score. But the problem with all this data, as the father in Minnesota demonstrated, is that Target couldn't let on how much they knew. After all, shoppers might get a little bit upset if they received an advertisement making it clear that Target was studying their reproductive plans. So how did Target solve this problem? 
they started mixing in ads for bottles and formula with other products that had nothing to do with pregnancy, like lawn mowers and wine glasses, things that they knew a pregnant woman wouldn't necessarily be interested in. As a result, the baby ads looked random, and it worked. Women started using the coupons, and Target's mom and baby sales exploded. The lesson? That, so, so this is a, I'm, I'm always really interested in the um, I'm always really interested in this example because it, it helps us think about uh, the way that data is actually influencing us before we even know it is, and the way that we can be surveilled. So we don't have that option to buy in or buy out. We're being tracked 85% accuracy on the trimester of a woman's pregnancy who shops regularly at Target is amazing. So then predictive advertising happens. So that's a constraint that, um, that we have to think about. So th this notion of surveillance. And then the last constraint is this notion of silence. And this is, again, an argument um, by Sherry Turkle. And she writes, we are being silenced by our technologies. These silences in the presence of our children have led to a crisis of empathy that has diminished us at home, work, and public life. And again, this is a scholar that has some controversial, definitely comes out of a protectionist strand of, of thinking about this. But she says, um, without conversation studies show that we are less empathetic, less concerned, less creative, and less fulfilled. And then her research, or research that she cited said, there's a 40% decline in markers for empathy in college students. Online communication makes us feel more in charge of our time and our self-preservation. So if we track this to notions that we're seeing now, notions of increased xenophobia, notions of, of more anti-immigration sentiment, at least in the United States, some people push to say this notion of, um, of technologies silencing us in, in forms of human connections are allowing us to be subjective to less empathy for others um, and, 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 less, uh, and less willing to kind of see across diverse aisles. And it's something that I think about a lot lately because I think we can see this now, uh, this turn to more personalized information habits less willingness to open up to think about others and less connection with humans. Um, and so, th so that, I think, could be a problem for us. Um, so if, just to stop for a second and recap this, before I kind of talk a little bit about how I see media literacy uh, engaging, uh, how we can create action-based pedagogy to promote civic engagement and action in daily life. We think about this collapsing relationship between media systems and civic, um, and civic participation in those systems perpetuated by mobility and spreadability and connectivity, that these three fact functions have brought us together. And then we think about the influence or the constraints that this has had on how we think about media literacy. If we are here really to, uh, to think about how we can te teach or prepare future generations for being active and engaged in daily life, I think we need to reframe, um, reframe that approach uh, and some of the work that Henry's done in the past has really approached this and been at the forefront of reframing this approach and thinking about more meaningful ways to enable active engagement and participation in digital culture. And not simply the critique of media, not simply the acknowledgement of media systems, but moving past that to think about active ways to promote this. And so some of these thoughts, um, some of these things I've been thinking about um, more in my recent work uh, in, in that book that I mentioned, um, I was thinking about this notion of civic agency, much, much like was um, discussed, uh, much like Henry mentioned earlier. And when I thought of civic agency, out of my research, I realized that there was that, that debate that wasn't tying in the ability to critique media. So that idea that if we just show people television news and show them how biased these are, that's okay, but without connecting that to this, this kind of critical agency, how they can use media to engage in responsible, inclusive, and active dialogue, uh, then, then that connection, without that connection, then there continue to be a disconnect in how we, um, how we can criticize media, but also how we see the potential to be part of the changing, the changing landscape of digital culture. Uh, and so, of course, this is, when I think about use of production and engagement, just to go back to Reinhold, I don't necessarily think about it in terms of there needing to be a large, um, that you need to become an active blogger or become an activist or start spreading political content or social content. That engagement and use can be on a spectrum. It can be quite, 
quite minor at first. It can scale up after some time. But I do think it's important for us to understand that how we use the new media actually defines how that, um, how that media will end up being used and misused for decades to come. So I think that really is, uh, I think that's really where, we, where I want to situate uh, the work that we think about here at ND Lab and the work that you think about in your teaching and your practice as well. Ethan Zuckerman wrote in Rewire uh, that if we want to maximize the benefits and minimize the harms of connection, we have to take responsibility for shaping the tools we use to encounter the world. So we have to take that responsibility. And I think media literacy is the way that we do that. It's the way that we start to take that responsibility and use that for our own goods, um, for our own aims and purposes. And I want to impart three ways that this happens that I, that I put forward in my book. And I will, um, I will, I'll share these with us and then I will stop, I'll stop after these. And I think there's a continuum here that's Starts with the notion of voice moves into agency and then scales towards power. And I'll, and I'll talk briefly about these, but I want to pick up on them tomorrow when we think about uh, civic activism in, in its sense. So, so this might provide us with a frame that we can think about when we move uh, into more, more active-oriented approaches to, to digital media literacy. So I think the notion of voice is, is where I start in voice. Uh, promotes expression as a necessary dictate for inclusive and diverse media ecosystems and the development of perspective and discovery through storytelling. So e even just the notion of teaching people about voice and civic voice, I think is, is at the heart, rather than teaching people how to critically analyze or the abilities to access and evaluate, the notion of voice, I think, allows people to become more critical in the first place. If they think about how to have their own voice and how that voice evolves, and how their expression matters, I think from there, notions of critique and critical inquiry become much more natural in the context of what people are trying to say and the stories they're trying to tell. Rather than starting from a removed sense of let's analyze that, that news clip or let's analyze this film, I think those do justice, but when you remove yourself from the media equation, it becomes much easier not to connect your personal sense of, of voice to what you're trying to deconstruct or critically analyze. So I think it's really important that we start notions with voice. Um, voice can be as simple as um, someone quitting work in an ingenious way uh, through a song and a quick video. Um, it, can also, um, it can also allow people, we have a presidential election happening now in the United States uh, that's quite controversial. Uh, and it can also allow people to fight back against power. So here um, is a logo that was released by uh, the Republican candidate. And, and it's a great way to think about people having a voice to express. So this, uh, this was controversial. People took light of this. It gave them an opportunity to fight back, uh, to provide a counter narrative to this candidate. And they used it, they used, um, they used humor and wit and sarcasm to do this. And I think the point is that they can enter through, they can create counter narratives to the, to the dominant narratives of the candidate um, through humor, but it allows them to provide a voice of dissent that isn't simply screaming back at someone who's screaming. And I think that's really valuable. So in this logo, there was, um, they were talking about the inappropriateness of the T and the P there. And how are we supposed to explain the new Trump logo to our children? Uh, another person um, sent back this and said, if any news outlets want to use the Trump Pence logo, I made it safe for TV, so to blur out the T and the P. So this is, again, this is using humor um, and using voice to kind of fight back against, uh, to fight back against the, the, dominant, uh, the dominant voices that exist from above that politicians get to use. Uh, so we can scream back at them or we can find other ways to subversively counteract their messages. Uh, research that I just finished doing on civic media and migration, a uh, large project uh, uh, with an organization in Germany. We found out that um, in this one that voice really mattered, that for migrants and refugees and receiving communities, you could provide all the data that you wanted about their plight, about their journey, about the communities they were going to. None of that really um, drove meaningful engagement with them. What mattered was their voices and the voices of the receiving communities. And the more that they could come into contact, not surprisingly, the more they saw each other on a human level and were able to engage and embrace on commonalities. The more removed they were, the more media focused on removed storytelling around data, 
um, the less meaningful those stories were to them. So I know we have some students in Salzburg, from Salzburg that are here today. We really focus on this notion of the story, the human aspect of storytelling, to try to create reimagined connections through, through voice, through this notion of voice. I think that's kind of at the heart of what, what, what we're trying to get to, um, what we're trying to get to here. Um, the second part after voice is this notion of agency. Henry talked a little bit about this earlier. I think agency promotes the critique and creation of media in support of diversity, inclusion, and tolerance. And so I'll just talk a little bit about agency as it's applied to the civic space here. Uh, it involves the capacities of citizens to work collaboratively across differences, uh, to address common challenges, solve problems, and create common ground. And it requires a set of skills, knowledges, and predispositions. And thirdly, it involves questions of institutional design particularly how to constitute groups and institutions for sustainable collective action. So for me, this notion of agency is how we take our voice and use this voice to work together across borders, across divides, um, and, a, and across differences to actually create meaningful dialogue. And again, that dialogue can be, um, it can start at the personal and scale up, or it can be largely civic and political and activist. But our notion of ACE is that we, everything that we critique and we create is about, is about using our voice to work towards inclusion and tolerance and diversity. And in this case, agency becomes about moving towards change. Again, the, what I'm talking about now is not, um, I think this, how agency is manifested, it will be manifested differently depending on the culture that we talk about agency in, the political systems, the social systems, and the civic systems. What I'm trying to provide here is a broad framework that we can apply and discuss within the context of local systems. Not that these are blanket um, absolutes that we must agree on. Uh, here's a project we did um, in 2013 where we had young people uh, take pictures and, and, and contribute essays and points of action around the biggest challenges to urban spaces in their, in their day. So we, we were trying to get them to come together and identify a few common uh, common issues that we might work on through them identifying urban resilience. So we had students looking at the notion of urban congestion, taking their own images, and telling stories about how that issue impacts their local community. So the power can start through their voice, and by bringing their voices together, they developed a sense of agency. They were coming together, they were using the support of their peers, and they were building dialogue. Um, we heard a notion about drugs. This is a problem that is uh, quite rampant, I think, in many places, particularly in the US and the United States, but also found ground with one student in Kenya who talked about drugs in their, in their part of the world. Um, again, dump sites, trash, urban problems. I know there was, I was here last year, right at the beginning of the uh, protests against the trash, which turned out to be much more than that in Beirut, but that was another place where common ground was delivered. Uh, flooding and climate change sustainability was another way that they talked about this. Homelessness was another one, and poverty was the final one. Um, that we have this notion of voice, and that voice can become an agency when we bring our stories together and try to find shared power within those stories. Uh, here's another example of, I think, of, of what we might think about agency, a response to a billboard. This is a billboard for an engineering uh, for an engineering degree in San Francisco State University. And one of the pictures uh, they put on um, a female, Isis Wenger, who was a platform engineer. And she said, my team is great. Everyone is smart, creative, and hilarious. And what happened online was, uh, this is one of the quotes. I'll read it at the bottom. If their intention, meaning the, the people who made this, is to attract more women, then it would have been better to choose a picture with a warm, friendly smile rather than a sexy smirk. So the idea, that they had, the idea that they had positioned this advertisement and that the community had objectified her simply by assuming that she was fake. So in, I think in a more traditional media literacy approach to this, uh, we might talk about these things and not be able to understand um, her voice or the way that this was created. And you can see um, a lot of negative publicity was put onto this ad and to her. And what happened was, um, this notion of agency was that people started this um, I look like an engineer campaign 
she wrote about her being a real platform engineer and her volunteering to be part of this campaign, and then thousands of other women around the world held up signs and created a movement connecting themselves across differences in support of, of engineers from around the world. So this is where I think voice scales to agency. And then lastly, this notion of power. Um, so if we can find our voice through media literacy, use that voice to connect, the power comes in how we use and misuse media to enable these meaningful connections. So the goal of power is almost the culmination. Power is a very complicated term. It's not something that we, um, that, that we can structurally address right now. But I think that notion of power emanates from seeing how your voice can come together with others and then lead to some effective change, the use or misuse of media to, um, to create meaningful connections that matter. Uh, so I'll, I'll end by this, this notion of what we do at the Salisbury Academy. It actually takes us through this concept of learning your voice, uh, here's what a group looks like, uh, and then starting with your voice, your personal expression, and scaling that into how agency is created with the group that's there, and then the power that might come in the outcome. So the power of this outcome, we focused on migration media and civic imagination, which you heard about this morning. And we ended up with a, um, with a publication. And the publication uh, shares, I'll show you quickly the overview of this. Um, it shares a series of essays that try to reimagine migration from a personal space. So all of these, all of these essays are written by teams of young people that come from different parts of the world. That, share, that went through a pretty rigorous process to identify their issues, to try to, to try to tell their story, and to use media to influence some change in the world. And the goal of this project, as you can see, the range and diversity of stories focused on reimagining how we think about the migration topic and how we can use media to tell passionate stories. This, I think, is where power emerges. The ability to have this impact, the ability to bring our voice and notions of agency together and to have something that we can now share and redistribute and tell over and over again. And I think this is, um, you can see here, and then you can also see the faces of the people behind. I don't know if I have the entrance is, but you'll see the community of people who have been telling these stories uh, from all over the world. And I think the power here is in the collective narrative of the group and how they approach um, storytelling. So, um, so I think where this all leads us for, our, for your work here and some of what you've heard already and some of what I want to impart is how we harness the potential of platforms and technologies to engage meaningfully in civic life dictates the collective value of their efforts. So I think the goal is for us to think about media literacy um, again, as more than simply a critiquing of the media, more than simply an approach to um, an approach to the role of media and how we think about uh, how we think about media influencing us, but almost how we think about ourselves influencing media, how we think about the personal space of the human in the media equation and the role of citizens in actually reforming and telling different stories. So media literacy can have this potential and digital literacy to do that, but I think we kind of need to see beyond traditional approaches to critique and use the tools that you're learning here and use the knowledge that you're gaining here and trying to find is this some way that can enable this connection between voice, agency, and power. Um, so tomorrow I'll be picking up on this um, in the form of digital civic activism in the morning, but I, I hope this was useful in setting some of the objectives for you today. So thank you. نشكر طبعا على المحاضرة القيمة وقدرين الجهد اللي بذلته لتحاضر اليوم أنت واصل يعني فجر بخصوص الأطفال أثناء المحاضرة بتعمل وسائل الإعلام عادة على صنع صور نمطية وبعض مرات ذهنية لأي أمر بدهيات كونه سواء عن مدينة أو عن أشخاص أو عن أي مؤسسات 
وبتركز في أعمالها على الأطفال الآن الأطفال بكون عندهم في تنشأة اجتماعية ذكرت أثناء المحاضرة أنه تنشأة اجتماعية كل ما لها مع الوقت في ظل الانفتاح الإعلامي تتراجع يعني دور المؤسسات الدينية والتعليمية والأهل أقل ما يمكن ممكن يكون صفر في يوم من الأيام طب كيف بدنا نحمي الأطفال من هذا المحتوى الإعلامي اللي بتدور هذه المؤسسات الإعلامية بحيث يميزوا وما يصير في عندهم قرص صور نمطية يصعب تغييرها في المستقبل يعني اللي بيصنع هاي الصور النمطية واللي ما بدها تتغير اللي هي الوسائل الإعلام والأطفال ما بيشاهدوا إلا بس وسائل الإعلام Thank you for that question. Um, it's a very important one. So I would say, um, so, the, so, so something like media literacy, first of all, this gets us back into the protection versus empowerment phase. I think some of this protection is, first of all, teaching our youth um, from a very young age about how media works, the systems of media at play, um, the structures of media that you hear about. But I think um, more importantly from a young age, I, I really think it's about um, you teach them about these systems, but then you also teach them how they can make a choice, how they have a voice, how, what, how their choices in media matter. They matter to what media is told, is told to their communities. So they have, they, their choices have influence. So, so by protecting them, we, are, we, we can expose them to what the media do right and what the media do wrong. I think that's exactly right. But I think in a century of telling people what the media do right and the media do wrong hasn't changed anything that the media have done. I can tell you for, we can tell you for the last 100 years about Fox News or about these five big corporations that own the media. It has not changed anything. I don't know if we keep talking about it, I don't consider that a positive way forward to continuing to change or reform the system. I think there needs to be a, a different approach, something that we move around the frame or something that we use that media to appropriate it for our own use. So by protecting our children, we can teach them about these structures, but also where and how they have valuable voices and how that matters for their communities, so for their families and for their schools. You go into school now and you see so much of this social posturing. You know, it's very hard for me to tell, I have two young daughters, one of them is six. It's very hard for me to go into the school and tell her not to do it because she's facing all these social pressures, right? But you can teach her how to use these tools to have her own voice and how to engage it meaningfully with them. And I think that's really where we, where we need media literacy to go. This notion of protecting them, if we tell them right from wrong, it's not going to change the systems. Changing the system needs to be giving them a way to have a voice in the space. And then that can lead to them, over time, reforming systems not as a one-off thing, but as a as a, a longitudinal thing. So, uh, I think these days uh, the sense of protection—it's not the isolation. A uh, sense of protection that we owe to our kids is to open doors, to educate, to um, develop their skill to understand, analyze what's the content out there, whether that's an internet content or even face-to-face -face content for them to be able to survive. It's not isolation anymore. It's the openness and education that we owe them for the right. future. Right, I think, thank you for that. So I, so I, think, I think that's right. So it's not, it's not isolation, but it's also this idea that um, it's almost this kind of issue of control and the fear that drives us into this space. So what, what, I'm, what I'm setting up today is just showing us some of the pressures that digital culture have placed on how we teach people about media and the way that young people especially learn to be, uh, learn about how the media system might influence them, but also how they play within them. And so on the first hand, it's not about isolation anymore, but on the second hand, it's, it's not about controlling how they use media or controlling, I mean, that could be part of it, but I think what I'm trying to get at is that there's so many other social influences that are not mediated, but they're technological. Like the whole the ideas of privacy and of performance, these are things embedded, I mean, we do this all the time as well. I think this is no longer just about young people, but when we do anything interesting in life, when we do anything fun, the first thing we want to do as a human default is share it with other humans. So we do this when I arrive in Beirut at four in the morning and I'm with these guys in the car. The first thing we want to do is take a picture and post it to let people know we're okay. So this is kind of the slippery slope of, the slippery slope of how young people also mature into these technologies. And so, I don't know if one argument might be let's try to shut it off or let's try to blind them from this. And 
I mean, I, I think that's a good one. I don't know if that's ever worked. It's, I don't think that's ever stopped it. It might have. I mean, it has in small places, but in the larger scope of things, um, you know, it's, 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 it's not, I don't know, it's one way to teach them, but I think more importantly it's about, I think it really just goes back to how they can facilitate meaningfulness and also understand that it's okay to have, it's okay to be leisurely online and it's okay to engage personally and it's okay to share and express as long as it's done um, in, in a certain context, so. Okay, well, thank you again for this, and um, enjoy lunch. <laughs>